Good evening. A warm welcome to all of you. I see a number of um, uh, old friends and new faces, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to Georgetown University's Center for International and Regional Studies. We have an incredible speaker tonight about which we're truly, truly honored and excited. I will introduce our speaker in a minute. Before I do, uh, allow me to just take care of a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. If I could ask you to please turn off your um, cell phones or put them on vibrate, uh, please. A summary of tonight's talk will be on our website, cirs.georgetown.edu, uh, within the week. Um, and of course, there will be a video and uh, pictures. Um, there will be a Q&A session following uh, Dr. Adeli's uh, talk. And our next monthly dialogue will be on April 21st. You might remember a few uh, months ago, back I believe in September, uh, we had a former Israeli soldier uh, from the Israeli Defense Forces come and give a talk. He has, he's now a community activist in Jerusalem. And so our next monthly dialogue speaker is a Palestinian businessman in Ramallah, Palestinian-American businessman, part of the uh, group of Palestinians who went back to Palestine after the signing of the Oslo Accord. His name is Sam Bahur. You might have seen him on CNN or uh, read one of his uh, many op-ed pieces. Promises to be a truly interesting uh, talk, and he will talk about uh, whether or not we need a new paradigm for Palestine in perpetual limbo. And so I think that's uh, quite, quite exciting. We are expecting a full crowd tonight, so if I may ask if there are empty seats between you to um, sit a little friendlier uh, to make room for others who might be, uh, who might be coming in late. And now the, um, uh, the speaker uh, for whom we're all gathered here uh, to hear. Um, one, of, um, one of CIRS says, my boss is here, so I want to make sure he notices. Uh, one of the uh, speakers we're most proud of, uh, boss, um, Sayed Mohammed Hossein Adeli, is the Secretary General of the Gas Exporting Countries Forum, the GECF. He's a career diplomat and has served as Iran's ambassador to Japan, Canada, and the United Kingdom. His previous positions include uh, having served as the governor of the Central Bank of Iran, deputy foreign minister for economic and energy affairs, and advisor to the president of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Upon retiring from the diplomatic corps, he founded the Ravand Institute for Economic and International Studies, which is today one of Iran's premier research institutes and consulting firms. Dr. Adeli, puts the rest of us to shame by holding not one but two PhDs, uh, one in business administration and the other in economics. And uh, we are thrilled and delighted to have him speak to us tonight about gas and alternative fuels, present and energy, uh, present and future shares and challenges. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hossein Adem. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kamrava, for your kind uh, introduction. Uh, Mr. Dean, uh, Dr. Kamrava, excellencies, distinguished guests, I'm uh, truly uh, pleased to have the opportunity to share with you uh, the visions we have in GECF about uh, gas. Uh, of course, uh, when uh, I go to the uh, academic uh, uh, places, I feel at home because uh, for many years I've been teaching economics, macroeconomics in different universities. But I make sure that I won't uh, follow the very traditional uh, lectures of the universities to, to keep on talking. Uh, uh, I have uh, uh, some 40 minutes, but I'm not going to use all of it because I am very much interested in also uh, getting your comments and interaction with you. 
basically, my uh, presentation or my uh, this lecture is this the one? Yes. Okay. Uh, is uh, divided into three parts. One is uh, a little bit about uh, GCF, a little bit of advertisement and propaganda about our organization. <laughs> then I'm going to talk uh, a bit about gas. And then the third part, which is the last part, would be about the various uh, fuels and the source of energy. If we want to start with the GCF, GCF is uh, the single largest organization of gas in the world. Uh, it's comprising of 17 member and observer countries. If we start from, uh, from uh, uh, Americas, uh, we see in the Latin America we have Venezuela, Trinidad Tobacco, and Bolivia are as our members. Then if we go to Africa, uh, in the North Africa we have Algeria, Libya, and Egypt and uh, Nigeria, Equatorial Guinea. Then if you move to, the, uh, to, our, to the Middle East region, we have uh, Iran, Qatar, UAE, and Oman. And uh, uh, up uh, uh, there is uh, Russia, is uh, uh, the, the biggest uh, gas country in the world. Then uh, we have some observer members as well. Uh, two of them are located in uh, Europe, Norway, and the Netherlands and two is uh, uh, neighboring us in uh, Iraq and Kazakhstan. Of course, uh, we have uh, other members uh, in the pipeline. We have at least one in the pipeline, which is coming maybe, hopefully, uh, by the end of this year, and a couple of others that are in the process of uh, becoming a member. So uh, this is uh, uh, the strength as, as uh, uh, far as the members is concerned. Then. Uh, Actually, we go about uh, our mission and, vi and our vision. Uh, but let me first say who we are. Actually, GCF holds 67% of uh, the reserves of gas in the world, which is uh, compared to any other organization, energy organization such as OPEC, is much larger because OPEC uh, holds something around 30 4% uh, uh, of the oil reserves of the world, whereas GCF 67%. We also uh, are responsible for 65% of LNG trade. Uh, of course, Qatar being a, a country which contributes to this very much. And then on the pipeline trade also, we hold 40% uh, of uh, pipeline trade. So this makes GCF as a very important uh, gas uh, organization. Now, on the vision and uh, the mission, what do we do in, uh, in Tornado Tower here in Doha? Uh, our vision is uh, to become an authentic platform for uh, gas activity, a center for gas studies, a center for exchange of uh, ideas and debate, a platform for exchange of experience. This is what we are trying our best to do. And of course, our mission is first of all to promote gas as uh, a clean fuel, then uh, to increase the market share of gas, of course, and uh, contribute to the stability of the global gas market or global energy market, as, uh, as a matter of fact, then to exchange data and information. So our organization is for exchange of experience, data, and information on gas activities. And of course, the, to develop dialogue with all stakeholders of energy market. And this is one of the most important tasks that we have defined for ourselves, to be in contact with other producers and exporters, to be in contact with consumers, with the business, and with academics, and with uh, all other uh, uh, stakeholders. So uh, then, having introduced this, I want to move into gas. On gas, uh, there are a couple of things that I would like to share with you. What is the demand and supply on gas? And what are the important dynamics of the market, actually, when we talk about gas? First of all, uh, as you see here, uh, I don't know whether this pointer is, but you see that the global gas demand uh, by sector, when you see that uh, uh, actually, gas consumption and energy consumption in general is increasing. 
and it's going to be doubled from now until 2035. And uh, the share of gas is going to be increasing, but uh, the demand is coming from different sectors. We have four sectors which are very important. One is the power generation, and second would be the domestic use as the heating of the spaces, and then we have transportation as well. But uh, the most uh, part of demand is uh, being driven by the power generation and power plants. So this is why we are very much eyeing to the power plants uh, uh, replacing uh, coal and uh, oil for gas. This is what we are at least uh, wishing to see. Uh, uh, so we see that uh, the uh, gas uh, demand and consumption is increasing at least something around 108 BCM per year. So this is the amount that every year we should have 108 BCM coming into the streamline of the production and then trading, uh, which is quite a lot. This means that we need enough exploration activity, we need enough investment and development, and we need enough trading as well. So just having reserves is not enough as we have it, I mean, there are lots of reserves. So this is why it's important also to think about this much of uh, incremental increase on every year basis. Uh, on the supply side, of course, we are going to have abundance of supply as well. Of course, uh, uh, most of the supply now is resources and reserves. It's not yet been developed, but there are existing uh, uh, projects that are under development and it is uh, uh, quite uh, hopeful, we are hopeful that uh, these uh, are, would be coming into the main stream of production. But as you see here, uh, uh, the, there are three areas, the green one, the blue one, and the pink one. Uh, these are the three areas of suppliers of, uh, of gas, which are very important areas. As a matter of fact, the first one is the Russia and the CIS countries. The second would be the Middle East, which is going to be also very important. And third uh, is uh, going to be the North America or the Americans uh, because of the recent shell gas uh, uh, development. So uh, uh, the suppliers would be the, uh, according to this region, but even as you see that the supply would be something around 5,700 BCM, uh, and uh, the, uh, the uh, demand also would be something around uh, 5,800 BCM. So, so uh, the, uh, this is in perspective. In 23 years from now, until 2035, we see that almost this is balanced. Of course, if we look at the midterm or the short term, uh, there is some discrepancies in from now until 2020. There is going to be slightly of more uh, supply, but from 2020 on, there is going to be slightly more demand than than supply. Of course, uh, and this is uh, and and uh, after 2030 there would be more demand than supply. Uh, and this is something that uh, uh, the people should think about it. But this is just an average of uh, this next 23 years that almost supply and demand are uh, balancing each other. So no worry about the security of supply, provided that there would be enough investment and security of demand as well. So this is why always in gas, uh, uh, market, uh, we are talking about long-term uh, kind of contracts which uh, would ensure the stability of the market in the, uh, in the future. Now, if we move uh, to a couple of uh, other things also is, is good to, to know. First is the uh, gas trade vis-a-vis -vis domestic supply. You know, gas is uh, uh, quite uh, an interesting uh, source of energy because it used to be a domestic commodity, domestically traded. And uh, it's been, as, as you see, that uh, uh, the whole, uh, this is the, the red one, is the domestic trade of gas. So this is why the dynamics and economics of, uh, of, uh, of the domestic uh, market everywhere is going to affect the external trade of, uh, of, the, of the gas. 
when it comes, for example, to the United States of America, whether uh, the U.S. Uh, would be able to export or not, that depends on many things, including the dynamics of the market inside the United States. Its pricings, its demand, its differentials of the pricing, the structure of the, all of these things. So this is why uh, gas is a domestic commodity. As you see, uh, most of the gas is traded domestically. And then the blue one is what internationally is traded. So it's some, something around 30% international commodity and uh, 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 at least 70% is an international, uh, is, an, is a domestic commodity. This is why it's very important to uh, acknowledge and to understand the dynamics of the domestic markets as well everywhere, even in, uh, in the producer's uh, market. I mean, in the producer's countries, when we talk about Middle East as an ex exporter, in order to be able to predict the amount of exports of the countries, we have to go to the uh, domestic market of these countries to see the dynamics of the market, whether the subsidies, the efficiencies, the uh, pricing structure, all of them are right in the place or not, so that to understand whether this much of export is going to take place or not. The other uh, uh, point which is very important about gas also is uh, LNG vis-a-vis -vis, uh, pipeline trading. As you see, uh, again, the, the blue one is the, uh, the pipeline and the red one is the, uh, for the time being, the uh, percentage is 30% uh, LNG and 70% is the pipeline. Uh, our estimate is that this would fluctuate a bit of 2%, but in perspective of 2035, this remains to be the same thing. It's important, this percentage, because when we talk about the market, market means forces of market, means supply and demand. But when we talk about pipeline, Pipeline trading is not a market trading because in pipeline there is a dedicated pipeline of a supplier, of one supplier mostly, and you have one uh, buyer. So one supplier and one buyer, there is no market forces. So this is why market here uh, has little to do uh, with the pricing uh, uh, mechanism or with other things. Uh, whereas when we are talking about LNG, and increasingly spot trading of LNG, then we have the market, and we have the market forces, and we have elements which would affect the demand, which affect the, uh, the supply, and would affect eventually the prices. So this is why the dynamics of changes uh, from pipeline trading to LNG trading is very important to understand how this would go. The, most of the, uh, uh, the uh, consultants and the analysts, including the uh, uh, different organizations such as IEA, such as uh, IEF, uh, and uh, the Department of Energy in the US and the, and the others, uh, would predict that pipeline trading would prevail most of the time and would have the same range of 70% to 30% or 69% to 31% or so uh, in the future. So in the future, we are going to have uh, uh, the LNG trading and pipeline trading at the same thing. What is important about LNG trading is that increasingly LNG is being traded on a spot basis rather than on a long-term basis. Although one of the uh, major LNG traders is Japan. Japan is the single uh, biggest importer of LNG, something around 35, 36% of the LNG of the whole world is being imported into Japan. But again in Japan, most of uh, this uh, uh, volume of, of LNG trading is uh, done according to the long-term uh, long contracts rather than spot trading. But increasingly in the past uh, maybe five years, the spot trading in LNG is uh, uh, becoming uh, a, a kind of uh, uh, feature in the, in the gas market. Uh, start, uh, starting from, uh, uh, from, uh, from US, Henry Hop, where there is a hub of trading and exporting, importing and trading over there, uh, 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 to, to UK 
NBP, the new uh, uh, port, uh, which uh, we see that spot is just uh, becoming a kind of uh, tradition in the, in the market. And then uh, when spot trading is, uh, is uh, uh, being uh, uh, welcomed by, by the traders, then this is gas to gas pricing or gas uh, pricing based on gas. Whereas when we talk about long-term contracts, whether it is pipeline or it is, uh, uh, it is LNG, it goes uh, for a, a kind of oil indexed uh, kind of pricing. So there is two kind of pricing now in the oil market, in the gas market. Uh, gas pricing based on gas, which is a spot, and uh, uh, we have also uh, uh, oil indexed pricing, which is uh, more used in the long-term contracts, whether it is pipeline or it is LNG. So from this point of view, it is important to understand that even if we assume that in the future, uh, let's say 80% of LNG would be, uh, would be traded on a spot, on gas-to-gas -gas basis, then it would no, not uh, be more than 30% of the total gas market because uh, pipeline trading would remain to be the uh, prevailing uh, uh, form of trading in, uh, in the gas market. So, uh, having said that, le let me now uh, come uh, to what it is called as a shale gas revolution. Uh, of course, uh, uh, coming from a revolutionary country, we are not that much uh, in favor of uh, these kind of revolutions <laughs> because we know the impacts. Uh, so, this uh, uh, shale gas revolution uh, is uh, uh, really uh, uh, leaving its own impact on the gas market, gradually and incrementally. Of course, all of us uh, know that uh, when we talk about gas, we have three kinds of gas. We have uh, uh, this uh, uh, conventional gas, which is uh, uh, gas fields. We have associated gas, where they extract oil, and uh, uh, associated with that, we have some, uh, uh, some gas coming uh, extracted uh, from this. But uh, there are, in the deeper shells of uh, sometimes, of course, it's not as deep as uh, uh, this figure, uh, that uh, uh, inside the shells uh, there are some, uh, some gases which you, you have to explode the whole thing, the whole shell, in order to get uh, some gas from it, which of course is not that much. Uh, and this, uh, uh, we have uh, a new technology of uh, horizontal drilling and also we have uh, uh, hydraulic uh, fracturing, which is a kind of explosion by pushing uh, uh, with pressure chemicals and as much as the water. So uh, uh, for the time being, this technology is uh, being uh, commercialized in the United States. It's not been used elsewhere. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, it is going to be used in the future, but uh, there are lots of controversy on this. So this is called unconventional gas, which of course, not only this, but also uh, we have unconventional oil as well. But this is what we are talking about. The unconventional gas or the shell gas or shell oil is uh, found everywhere. You see, this is the map of the world, and you see that everywhere there, there are shell gases. Uh, in uh, North America and South America, in the North America we have it in US and Canada, in the South America we have it in uh, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and the others. Then in, the, in North Africa, we have in Algeria, we have in others. And uh, in, in Asia, actually, we have uh, in China, we have lots of them. Uh, China, one of the biggest consumer of energy also, uh, they have uh, big reserves of shell gas. Uh, so uh, uh, shell gas is uh, found everywhere. But uh, these are the, the this, this is a kind of map of, uh, of uh, what we call it uh, technical recoverable uh, resources, uh, TRR. China, Argentina, Algeria, USA, Canada, Mexico, Australia, South Africa, Russia, Brazil, uh, and uh, we have uh, other uh, small places with very, very small amounts of uh, shell gas. But you see, what, one thing about shell gas is very important, that although there are resources everywhere, but we don't know whether uh, there are uh, uh, 
adequate environment to do that or not, to, to develop the shale gas or not. Because first of all, uh, uh, shale gas uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, much uh, more expensive than, than the conventional gas. This is number one. So wherever there is conventional gas, nobody is uh, prepared to develop shale gas. This is number one. And as, as long as they can get uh, uh, LNG or uh, pipeline gas, uh, they, don't go, uh, they, don't, they don't go for that. Uh, secondly, uh, they need uh, technology. They need enough technology to develop it. Uh, and uh, uh, not only technology, but also abundance of water. I mean, uh, uh, shell gas needs abundance of water in order to inject for just extracting it. And also, uh, there is another point about it, uh, which uh, we found it recently, and that is uh, in some places it has caused some earthquakes. I mean, Netherlands is one of the uh, recent examples that it created uh, some sort of uh, reservation on the, on, the, on the part of the uh, public uh, to stop uh, the hydraulic uh, fracturing. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, last but not the least, and maybe the most important thing is destruction of the environment. So this is why the environmentalists are all against uh, uh, this kind of technology. So this is why we in GCF, we say that the present level of technology for extracting shale gas is not, uh, uh, is not uh, uh, actually uh, uh, giving uh, uh, the right signal for development of shale gas resources. So this is why we would like to see the level of technology improves uh, uh, for the time when shale gas could be really uh, developed. And for the time being, we don't uh, uh, recommend uh, uh, unless it is uh, uh, in the countries where they have uh, less, uh, uh, less uh, uh, energies. So this is uh, about shell gas. Now, my last part. <clears throat> the last part is uh, talking about uh, uh, gas vis-a-vis -vis other alternative sources of energies. You see, gas is good. We say it's good, at least, because uh, it is abundant. This is number one. It's easily developed. I mean, the development of gas in the Middle East uh, uh, has a very uh, low uh, uh, cost. It's flexible because it can be burned directly to generate heat and power. And it can be converted to liquid fuel for transportation. I mean, this LNG. And uh, can be uh, chemically processed to produce lots of other uh, byproducts or products. And it's environmentally friendly because it's... Uh, uh, it, uh, uh, um, the emission of uh, CO2 emission is, is less than any other uh, alternative source of energy. And it's efficient because uh, using it in the power generation also uh, has more efficiency if it is used in the power generation in uh, comparison with coal and oil. Uh, here also is uh, uh, the, 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 the polluting uh, kind of uh, share of each of the, uh, the red one is the coal with 43% and oil with 36% and uh, uh, gas uh, uh, is uh, 21%. Uh, now let's see how uh, would be the development of the different kind of uh, fuels. How is it? Uh, we see that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the red one, which is the natural gas, we see it's on the rise. So something around uh, uh, now it's 23, 24% of the energy mix is uh, gas, which uh, we think that it's, uh, it's going to uh, increase to something around 26, above 25%. This is what uh, gas is going to. But this is uh, going to be in the, uh, at the expense of coal. The anticipation is that the coal would decrease. And oil also would decrease. Oil is something around 33%, 34%, and then it would come down to something around 29%. So the oil is on decline, the coal is on decline, the one is on rising, the star is gas, and of course the renewables also are going to be uh, uh, in the, uh, on the rise. So these are the two, uh, slightly, we see that they are in the rise. Uh, this is also 
going, this is the pie chart of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the different fuels, which uh, can, you see that uh, uh, gas is 24, now it's 26, I mean in 2035, and 2030, and uh, whereas uh, the oil, which is 33%, is going to uh, come down to 29%, and coal as well. But of course, all of this prediction is dependent on what uh, uh, we would like to uh, examine now here. That depends on the policy options of the countries and the regions. This is very important to have the right policy uh, for uh, having uh, uh, less uh, emissions and uh, a cleaner kind of environment. As we see here, China is a big question mark. What would be the policies of China? Because China is now responsible for, uh, for something around 40% uh, of the CO2 emission in the world. And if they continue to, uh, to uh, uh, consume uh, coal, as they are consuming right now, uh, in 2030, they would be responsible for 66% of CO2 emission of the world. So you would have, we would have a very uh, polluted world uh, with one country uh, responsible for that. So it's very important that the increase of urbanization in China, which is, uh, uh, I, I think that it, it is uh, every 14 uh, days we have... Uh, we have uh, a kind of uh, a city of uh, one and a half million uh, population in China. And uh, if they choose the transportation and the others just uh, uh, um, uh, with coal, then this would happen. So this is why China is a, is a very uh, important uh, place. Of course, uh, there is now uh, something they call it a smog issue. The smog issue in China, which is highlighted by smoke issue, is uh, creating problem for China. So the chi chi Chinese government uh, has announced that because of the smoke issue, they are going to decrease coal and increase gas. This is what they have said they are intending to do so. So it's not yet a policy. They have announced their intention. So if this intention converts and transforms itself into a solid, firm policy, then we would be very much relieved. In the U.S., in the U.S., uh, the uh, the policy is uh, a bit uh, more uh, clear because uh, they want to export coal and to use more gas. So this is what they have started to do. So and they are doing so, and uh, uh, so that is uh, uh, there. But uh, then we have uh, Japanese policy and the European policy. I would like to start with Europe. Europe also is a big question mark because when we talk about Europe, we don't know where we should talk about. EU is, has a discrepancy of, of, uh, of policy. There is not a united policy to, to say that although they have the third package, they have uh, uh, indicated uh, CO2 emission to put ceiling on that, also the efficiency, and the renewables, these are the three categories Europe are just uh, focusing on. How much CO2 emission they should have, how much efficiency they should have, and also how much renewable should have. Well, some countries uh, comply with that, many countries do not comply, and they have different kind of views. In Germany, we are uh, expecting uh, uh, a new policy uh, on energy in, in the next few months. In uh, France, we are expecting something to come out uh, right after uh, April, in April. In EU, it is being now discussed, and by the end of March, there is going to be something coming out as the policy. So these are the things that uh, in Europe is happening, and uh, we have to see what will happen, whether in uh, some countries, re renewable are going to be 20% and 27% of, uh, of their share, and in some countries still 7% and below 10%. So it's very important to see. And in Europe, the development of the recent years are very disappointing because they have reduced the gas, uh, consumption of the gas, and they have increased the, the coal because of the uh, financial uh, problems they have had. Uh, in Japan, the policy are being developed. 
Of course, we have the distinguished ambassador of Japan here. I cannot uh, speak uh, on behalf of Japan, but we are monitoring Japanese uh, policies and, and uh, election of the mayor of Japan, uh, which uh, uh, just signaled to everybody that uh, nuclear is on the rise. So the nuclear uh, uh, policy is going to be after Fukushima and closure of all Japanese uh, uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, there is uh, going to be a policy of uh, uh, bring them into uh, the mainstream of, of the electricity. So maybe in the future, in the, in the next uh, five years, we are going to see something around 20 of the nuclear power plants uh, um, resu resuming their, their activities after the uh, thorough inspections that they are now uh, uh, going through it. So Japan's policy is very important because they are the biggest importer of LNG and they are also, as we see, Japan also uh, uh, consumes uh, oil in the red uh, uh, very much. So these are the policies that are important and this is the duplication of that but uh, in more elaboration. Well, uh, uh, also this is the same thing about the competing fuel everywhere. I mean, this is, as we see, for example, uh, uh, here uh, uh, we have uh, in the North America, we see renewable are the same, but natural gas is on the rise. Uh, oil is on the rise, but coal is, uh, is, is on the uh, just uh, reduction. Here in South America, we see renewables are coming down. And uh, oil and coal is the same. Natural gas is going up. Here we see in Africa, again, natural gas is on the rise. And uh, we see uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, we see that the natural gas is coming down. So uh, uh, opposite of what uh, people may think. Uh, in Asia, also, we see that uh, natural gas would be the same as uh, it used to be there. So this is the recent development which may be indicating of the future, future policies uh, in the future. So I come to, to the end of my uh, presentation now by just saying that uh, uh, there are some few challenges. On the uh, natural gas, of course, uh, as I said, the policy options of the countries is uh, one challenge. And the big uncertainties which exist in the, in the big countries in Europe and in China. These are the two uh, areas. Also on the supply side on the gas is the main exporting countries because the main exporting, gas exporting countries, they have got problems inside their own countries. Uh, efficiency of energy, the subsidies and other things are very, and the price structure because unless they address these problems and these challenges, they wouldn't, won't be able to supply that much gas as they are supplying. On oil, of course, uh, penetration in the power generation sector and the industrial sector uh, uh, very limited. So this is uh, the challenge for oil. On the nuclear, uh, we have quite divergence of, of the views and divergence of the policies. On the one hand, we see France and, and, and Japan are pro-nuclear and we see Germany are just prohibiting and stopping it. So it's... Uh, uh, there is the challenge of the public uh, and the constituency, public opinions and the constituency. Renewable, everybody is in favor of renewable. So this is uh, the favorite one. But it's difficult to achieve. I mean, although uh, Europe is putting uh, the uh, target of uh, uh, 2020, having 20% 20 of their uh, energy mix as renewables, but uh, it's very unlikely to be uh, materialized. Or on 2030, they have put 27% uh, of the energy mix to be renewable. But this is also not going to be achievable. Although in some countries may be achieved, but not in all countries. My conclusion is very simple. Demand for energy is rising very rapidly. It, 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 it's going to be doubled in the next 23 years. Gas is, is a rising star in this energy demand. Gas market remains to be regional. We don't think that although it's becoming more global, but remains to be regional according to the regions and its own dynamics of the, of the region, pipeline uh, versus LNG uh, and also versus spot, 
and oil index versus the others. Shale gas has been a new development. However, there are many uncertainties. The uncertainty is not for the US. US, US has already had its own impact and its own benefits over there. When we are talking about uncertainties, uncertainties in Europe and the others, and policy options of different countries is going to be very important for the future. So thank you very much for your attention.